Hello, everyone. We are back. It is March, so it is a new roundtable. Yes, it is a roundtable because there are three of us. There are some <laughs> questions. <laughs> I would like to address some of the, the viewer comments right away. <laughs> Um, it's great to be back here with John in Toronto and Steve in Vancouver. How are you guys doing? Always a pleasure. Yeah, been, good to be like back. It's been a while. There's been a lot of things happening in the market. So yeah, excited to sort of dive into it this week. Yeah, I agree. I love it. And Steve, we can really see your, your bull and bear uh, art there. Perfect. Sign it's of the perfect. times. Yes. <laughs> We're hearing your feedback. I've also invested in a mic. We are listening to you guys. So... <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to all our viewers, viewers for all their questions. We're going to get to some of them. Why don't we just start again with a market overview? John, in Toronto, you were mentioning last time we spoke, there were signs of some heating up. I think, if I'm not mistaken, we're going to see a bit of a climb in, in price, average prices. What's going on in Toronto? Yeah, I mean, it, it wasn't very popular last month when I suggested that, but... Uh, yeah, that's the way the year's starting. I mean, I don't think anyone expected it. I didn't expect it, but the market is uh, is actually very competitive in Toronto. Uh, inventory levels are plummeting. Like I just tweeted today that uh, we have about one and a half months of inventory for low-rise homes. The last time it was that low was in April of 2022, when the Bank of Canada's rate was 1%. So like who on earth expected uh, inventory to plummet. And again, a lot of this is right now in the GTA is just driven by even though demand and sales are like 20 year lows, um, the demand is outpacing the supply of new listings, like just to like put some picture and sort of context to it. When we look at what has happened from January to February of this year, 2023. Um, in that one month period, we had 1300 more homes sell in February than we did in January but only about 500 more new listings hit the market, right? And this is why inventory is trending down. This is why prices are actually trending up. I think they're at like their highest level since June, like average prices in the, for, for low rise homes. Condo prices have been a little bit more stable, but, but low rise prices have picked up a little bit. Uh, and again, I, I mean, it's just shocking that this is happening, but I'd say the biggest factor right now is that just listings are so low and, and no one's selling and and the few buyers that are out there are finding it tough to find uh something that's available so what do you find shocking john because you've already mentioned in your previous updates that you know january february we normally see a bit of this i'd call it a bottleneck where yeah. buyers tend to jump in even cyclically every year yeah. faster than you know maybe sellers are ready to list the shocking part of this was what that the high interest rates didn't keep these buyers away yeah, I mean, or the that the sellers aren't there. It's it's both. Like, I mean, I would have expected that the higher rates would kind of keep a lid on demand. Do you know what I mean? And that we would not be in this environment where sales are outpacing new listings on the one hand. And on the second hand, I would have expected at least a slighter, slightly higher volume of listings hitting the market. You know what I mean? And and again, you know, we talk about distressed sellers and are we going to start to see that as rates go up? The reality is, you know, before people like default on their sale, they, you know, they put the home for sale to try to sell it on their own terms to try to move on. It, you know, they can't handle the higher rates. And we're not seeing that like people are adjusting. And part of it is that the banks are just not increasing people's mortgage payments. And, you know, Steve and I tweet about this and extending amortizations, allowing people to like effectively have their mortgage payments, not even cover the interest now. So the banks are working with owners. And this is one of the reasons why we're not seeing a ton of listings. And I, again, I did not expect that to happen. Um, and again, I think that's one of the reasons why the market's just behaving the way it is. Okay, well, let's dig more into that. But first, sure. I want to go to Steve Vancouver. What's the situation there, Steve? Are you seeing the same kind of pattern? Low level of sales, but prices holding or going even slightly up because the demand is really outstripping the supply. Yeah, just to quickly touch on John's point, because um, I think it kind of, you know, his last point being, you know, you're not seeing this distress selling, um, you know, and and so we know that the, obviously people their mortgage balances are growing and they're basically, you know, negative amortizing at this point, you know, so your amortizations are extending from, you know, original contract was a 30 year am now it's turned into a 45 year am. So, 
and that's not resulting really in, in these distressed listings coming to market. So I'll just give you a quick idea. I had a conversation with the gentleman, uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago. And so he calls me up and he says, hey, you know, I've got a house, an investment property. I bought it near the top of the market. I don't really want to take a loss on it. Um, but basically he says, well, I'm not, I don't, I don't need to sell it because my mortgage payment hasn't changed and the rents are pretty much covering and I said, oh, more, so you must have done a fixed rate. He goes, no, I did a you know floating variable at TD Bank. Um, but what they do is they don't they don't increase my monthly payment because I you know when I originally bought the house I was seventy percent loan to value, and so they basically allow him to sort of uh, all the excess interest that he should be paying, but he's not paying. They're just tacking it onto the balance, uh, and they they allow you to do that so long as you don't exceed eighty percent loan to value. So. Uh, long story short is, in my opinion, if that wasn't the case, it probably be would probably would be a listing that would be coming to market. Um, but the idea here is, well, let's hope that rates drop in you know 12, 18 months from now, and his problem pretty much goes away. Obviously, we're gonna we're gonna see how that plays out, but I think that's a really important you know topic on the distressed listing side. Um, yeah, uh, and Vancouver market pretty similar to to the GTA. Um, I mean, it's it's a strange market, you know, everybody on, you know, Twitter, YouTube commenting and, and looking at like one data point and sort of extrapolating their opinions on the market. It's really tough because you, you have to sort of sift through all the data right now to try to figure out exactly what's going on. And uh, the reality is, is that new listings are so weak. Uh, you know, demand is still relatively soft, but the, the new listings are basically so weak that if you do have, you know, let's say an entry level house, like the chances are you're probably going into multiple offers. Um, prices are moving higher. Uh, plenty of examples of that. But basically, if you had a property listed for sale three, four months ago versus today, you're getting a higher price today. And that's simply a factor of sentiment has changed. So it's, you can't go in and you can't go in and lowball sellers right now on, on, on a lot of product. They go, why well, I got no competition, I'm not dropping my price. And she ends up in multiple offers. Uh, you know, we had a 26 year low in new listings in greater Vancouver, 26 year low. So again, I didn't have that. That wasn't in my sort of crystal ball coming into the year. So it's uh it's strange. I mean, like I said, don't you know? To John's point, I mean, sales. If you look at them, they're still they're still weak. They're still still well below ten year averages. Um, but it's also a function of there's nothing for people to buy. And so we're kind of in this weird stalemate where would be sellers. I think there's just like there's uncertainty. John, I'm really curious your yeah. thoughts of like why are people because people keep asking me why are they not listing? Where's where's all of the inventory gone? Well, John, can yeah. I interject to this tweet yeah. you threw up? <laughs> yeah. Why are there so few homes for sale? Yeah. Uh, you retweeted Ryan Lundquist's great image here. Homeowners not selling. And the image uh, below is a very proud, I think they're at a Mozart concert. <laughs> My mortgage rate is 2.25%. <laughs> I'm not going anywhere. Uh, that I is a question. Like, I, I have a feeling, John, are people not stuck? Like, are we not yeah. seeing the usual people that would upsell or try to upsize, try to get the bigger house, get out of their condo into a house for their kids, not wanting to requalify at higher mortgage rates or not yeah. being able to? Yeah, I think that's part of it. Like, I think part of the low listing volume is that, you know, um, people aren't moving. You know what I mean? Like people aren't upsizing because like they have a two and a quarter mortgage rate. They don't want to go and renew and get uh, a five percent mortgage or five and a half percent. Uh, rates are higher. It's harder to upsize than what it was two years ago or a year and a half ago. So I think I think the fact that fewer people like because every one who upsizes is a potential sale as well. Um, so we're seeing less of that happening. And I think we're just seeing like investors just buckling down again. I didn't bank on banks being so friendly to people with variable rate mortgages and allowing them to have this, you know, like Steve said, negative amortization where their payment doesn't even cover their their interest. I mean, I didn't I didn't predict that. And that obviously throws a massive has a huge impact on on the whole housing market. If, if that 
if that borrower, if all of those borrowers who now have negative amortizations, if they actually had to increase their payments to not just cover the interest, but also pay down the principal, like their payments would have gone up 30 plus percent, you would have seen way more listings hit the market. Like not most people can't handle that. Like investors can't handle that. I, you know, and, and that's one of the reasons I thought we'd see more listings, and the, but the banks well, are being very friendly. I got to interject um, there. What? Go. <laughs> Go for well, it. Well, I mean, let's be, let's be honest, right? It's like, I mean, the banks are doing this. This helps the banks. I mean, the yeah. banks, the banks are lending money against your house. Okay. When you have 20% of loans, you know, at CIBC that aren't even paying enough interest, to, you know, their monthly payment isn't even covering all the interest. They can't have all these distressed sellers flooding the market and, and, you yeah. know, you know, basically tanking prices and tanking the market. That's, that's the bank's collateral. So let's call a spade a spade. Yeah. Um, you know, the banks are essentially working together here to, I think, work through this issue. And so again, it's kind of curious, you know, because this becomes a bigger problem, you know, a year from now, two years, three years from now, and if you people come up for renewal and they're going to have these sort of balloon payments, they're going to have to figure out now, I think it's unrealistic to sit here and suggest that the regulators are just going to sit idle. Mm -hmm. So if it really becomes a massive problem, OSFI works for the bank. OSFI works for the banks. They don't really work for the people. They work for the banks. And so I'm curious, like what, what, if anything, it, 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 it what they do. Steve, but let's jump in here and unpack a bit what you're saying. So you, you're talking about OSFI, the regulators of banks changing things around. You had a great tweet here. Both TD and CIBC have just over 25% of the residential, sorry, residential mortgage book with amortizations greater than 35 years. Last year, that number was basically zero. So they're changing things on the fly and apparently OSFI is allowing it. Well, they're allowing, yeah, I mean, I, I suppose, I mean, they're basically allowing people's amortizations to, to, to grow. Right. So, and, and I'm not saying that, you know, OSFI should, should come in and should do this. I'm just saying, mm -hmm. like, I'm just be, trying to be practical and saying, okay, like if I'm a regulator of financial institutions and my sole mandate essentially is financial stability, um, this is a pretty glaringly obvious financial stability risk. So how are the regulators going to deal with it? if it becomes a larger issue in 12 to 24 months. Mm -hmm. Well, 25% um, is an issue. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, guys, uh, we but, shouldn't be seeing 35 year mortgages, right? Correct. It's on, yeah. Yes, but it's on origination, right? So you can't yes. originate a loan yes. with a 35 year end. Right, but, but they're but, through a back door. This yeah. is now happening. Essentially, yeah. So and this they, is already happening. And if you chat with anyone that actually works at the bank, that's relatively high up, they'll tell you what they're doing, right? So they 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 actively work with each borrower. Um, they don't like the bank doesn't want their clients to foreclose. Mm -hmm. So it looks bad on the bank. It looks bad on the homeowner. It's not good for the market. And so they actively work with people to sort of get them back on track. And so they will allow people to sort of refi and extend their amortizations you know, behind the scenes. So it is happening. Like the, the, you know, the reality is you can't raise rates 400 basis points in, in a year and expect that there's not going to be issues. I think there are issues, but we're kind of figuring it out and, and working through it. Similar to like the mortgage deferrals at the, mm -hmm. at the beginning of the pandemic, when, you know, everyone's losing their jobs. Like, I, I suppose, what did you think the banks and the regulators were going to do? Just let everybody foreclose. So they allowed mortgage deferrals. And I think we're kind of seeing a similar thing, which is they're allowing people to basically extend and pretend. So uh, I love that, Steve. Thanks. Extend and pretend. Love it. Uh, John, let's uh, put up a tweet here. Uh, Steve already alluded to 20% of CIBC mortgage holders are in a position where their monthly payment is not high enough to cover even the interest portion of their loans. Mm -hmm. I've heard you say that you can't believe you're seeing that in Canada. Can you unpack why that is astounding? I mean, it's it's a I mean, it's astounding just to think about like you have a mortgage on a home and your payment doesn't even cover your interest. Like you you're basically your debt is actually growing every year. Like if you think about this and you talk about this like two, three, four, five years ago, like no one would think that prudent Canadian banks would allow that, right? Um, but like to Steve's point, there are a lot of reasons, and they're and he's he's 100 percent right. They're not doing this with everybody. If you're like 
you know, if you bought with 10% down a year ago, um, and prices have declined, like you're not doing that today, right? You need to have a certain amount of equity and capital. And I think part of it is, as Steve said, the banks don't want to take your home, they want to protect sort of the house prices. I actually, you know, the other big factor, I think is also, I, I think between the banks and, you know, the federal government and Finance Canada, they're worried about a massive shock on consumer spending. If everyone's you know, payment, mortgage payment goes up a thousand or fifteen hundred bucks a month because of this payment shock. That's less money they have to spend in the economy. You know, that takes us from a mild recession to a deep recession, which leads to bigger issues. So I think there's a lot of reasons why the banks are doing that, but it's just it's surprising that to me, at least they're not even requiring people to bump up their payments to cover their interest. I think that's what I find the most shocking. You know what I mean? And diff different, different lenders. Um, you know, I know like, for example, RBC requires you to get, it requires you to put at least $2 each month towards your principal pay down $2. Uh, <laughs> but at least, you know what I mean? Like you can't, you can't negative amortize. You can't, yeah. you can't tack it onto the balance. There are certain lenders. Yeah. CIBC, TD, I think BMO actually is what well. I could be wrong, mm -hmm. um, but they do allow you to basically tack on that deferred interest. That's interesting. So that brings us to a question that I think you guys have been touching on from a viewer, Road and Bridge Guy. Question, is the mortgage amortization extension by several banks just creating additional supply constraints? In a normal environment, those mortgage holders would have placed their properties on the market. Some banks have up to 20%, as we mentioned, of their residential mortgages in 35-year amortizations. I think, Steve, you said yes. Yeah. I we would I, see those listings. Yeah, anecdotally, because I get the phone calls on the other end, right? So, hey, what should I do? This is my situation. Um, and so, yeah, a lot of the times, like I said, you know, um, we're, so, I mean, John, I, I think we, I've definitely heard, seen, worked with, you know, some investors um, that they have been, you know, their payments have gone up on their variables and, and they aren't able to raise the rents. And so they have been, they'll say, you know, I don't want to lose 600 bucks a month anymore, 700 bucks, 800 bucks a month on my investment condo. Let's sell it. Mm -hmm. And there's, and then some, some are selling and then, you know, maybe they have a portfolio of two or three condos. They might just sell one or two just to sort of, you know, get increased liquidity. So, yeah, I, I mean, but yeah, no doubt we would have more listings. I think if you had sort of a true, price discovery. Uh, so actually, Steve, let's stay on your point there. Another viewer question here from Victor D. What percentage of your investor clients are over leveraged to the extent that they would need to sell in the next six months? Now, is this a case of the clients that you mentioned having to sell or them trying to balance, like you said, a portfolio of a couple properties? Yeah, all of them. Uh, no, it's... <laughs> I don't have like we, we don't like to use the word all here at Moose Rally because we're yeah, I don't call my clients. Here. I don't call my clients and ask them to send me their uh all of their cash flow statements every month. Um honestly, like I think anyone that follows my work, I think knows that uh you know, I'm a numbers guy. I'm not uh, I'm certainly not like a, a pumper and it's it's you know, we we educate our clients to the best of our ability and let them make their own decisions. So, um yeah, we're not uh not, I'm not really like huge on the investor side, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, we definitely have a decent amount of investor clients, but I think I would say a bigger part of my personal book of clients is it tends to be a lot of young families. Mm -hmm. Right. But even practically, John, like I know that even amongst your clients, these are not big time investors. These are people that, you know, probably didn't sell the condo they moved out of when they went into their bigger family home. Yeah. Are you hearing from people like that now? There was a time where holding on to those properties was fine and it was actually a great move. I mean, I'm, you know, Steve's right. I mean, I don't, I don't follow up with past clients, ask them how they're doing. That's not a good conversation, but, um, but I'll say that I haven't had a lot of calls. Like usually if people are, are feeling the stress, they think they might sell you get calls. I mean, some of some clients who I speak with regularly of investment properties, you know, have commented to me that they're with Scotia and their payments went up and they're managing it. You know what I mean? Um, so I haven't seen a ton. I haven't heard personally a ton of distress from investors. Um, so that's again, I think that's I don't know if that's just them being able to manage the payment increases or just working with their bank and, and they're not seeing it yet. Yeah, I would say that too on my side. I'm not getting it's not a it's not a couple phone calls every day, right? It's like it's yeah. the odd one, but it's it's an interesting, you know, these are interesting 
anecdotal conversations where, you know, you're like, oh, okay, like it is happening. It's, it's certainly an issue for some. Um, but I think for others, like, you know, I haven't heard from a lot of our investor clients. So I assume it's all good status quo. Um, again, it kind of depends when did you buy it? You know, what, what did you do? Like not every investor is on a floating rate mortgage. Right. So, um, it just depends. Mm -hmm. Let's turn uh, our attention then to buyers. Uh, we have a question from Ali. Who is buying at these rates? Basically, has there been a change in buyer profile? Investors, first-time home buyers, between January and February this year compared to last. Uh, is there any data release available that sheds light on this? Another question from our viewer, uh, AG Chennai. Any insight in who are the people buying homes for 1 million stress tested at six and sevens? Are these first time home buyers, upsizing families, institutions, or investors? So a real question out there, who are the buyers that are out there right now? John, you want it? Yeah, sure. I mean, we're, I'm, we're seeing, I'm, what we're seeing is it hasn't changed. Like they're disproportionately families, a lot of, a lot of first time buyers, some upsizers. I mean, and I think one thing to just keep in mind is that, um, you know, with rates the way they are and just with everything that has gone on, like a, a lot of housing purchases now are driven way more by capital than by income. And what I mean by that is like, you can only borrow like four and a half, maybe five times your income in Canada. Like it's probably closer to four and a half now with rates the way they are, or maybe even four. But prices in the GTA are like close to nine or 10 times income. So that difference is coming from somewhere, right? And people are getting um, either, you know, they've owned a condo for a very long time and they have a ton of capital in it and they're just moving that to their next home. So, you know, they have like a 50% down payment or 40% down payment or they're getting money from family um, as a gift. So all of these types of things, I think, are... Um, are behind the demand that we're seeing. It's not like, you know, first time buyer with 5% down payment. Usually people have much bigger down payments. I think that's like so spot on. It's like, you look at these prices and yeah, I get it, right? You look at the incomes, you go, well, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Like the down, the people are, I don't know where they're coming up with. People are coming with large down payments. Like the biggest sort of factor of what I see, like, okay, like what's the hottest segment of the market right now? Um, in Vancouver, that's entry level detached house. Mm -hmm. Um, so basically anything that families can sort of find a way to get in, like their, their family's growing, they're not going to sit on the market, sit on the sidelines, waiting for two and a half years for the market to like, maybe, maybe not crash. Like they need, they need to get on with their lives. Um, and you know, their family's growing, they want their kids to go to a certain school. Uh, they got to move. They're tired of waiting. Uh, and so they're making moves um, and they're, they're, you know, begrudgingly accepting obviously 5% mortgage rates, but uh, any house in greater Vancouver that's, you know, listed under 1.8 million, it's going into multiple offers. That's, you know, basically an entry level house. Sad to say, but that's the, that's what the entry level house basically costs. And um, there's, there's a ton of demand out there because, the reality is, is you've got, I think a lot of these young millennial families are, are, are starting to grow. They're starting to have kids um, and they need the space. And we don't build new single family houses in greater Vancouver. We're not adding more new houses into the market. We're building more condos. Uh, we're not building more houses. And so I just think there's this, there is a perpetual demand, I think, at that entry level for, for detached house. And so that's what I'm seeing. I'm not really seeing any invest like investors are very very few and far between uh, which is a huge change from 24 months ago um but yeah i mean that's what i can say here mm -hmm. so is the sentiment behind these buyers uh that things are not that great but they will eventually be okay in the long run somehow and that's going to bring me to this discussion of bear traps <laughs> I I mean, I think to some extent, like I think a lot of the people moving just need a home. I think that's mm -hmm. what like what's missing in this when we think about who are the buyers, like mm -hmm. they just started a family, they just had a kid or something is like pushing people to move. You know what I mean? And I think that's a lot of the purchasers today. And I do agree. I think a lot of the sentiment is, OK, I'm buying at whatever X percent now, but rates are only going down from here. You know what I mean? Like. And obviously, people realize it's not immediate, and it might take two to three years. 
Um, you know, but I think people are thinking that, you know, they're buying at these higher rates, they'll lock in for two years and, you know, two to three years from now, they'll, you know, they'll, they'll have a lower mortgage payment because rates will drop a little bit. So if they can just muscle through this short period. The big thing I've noticed, John, in the market is just like the sentiment change. Um, the sentiment like four, five, six, seven months ago was just horrendous, right? Yeah. Like, you know, when, when Tiff Macklin was raising rates 100 basis points at a time and everyone's like, oh my God, how high are they going to go? How bad is it going to get? Like people don't want to make decisions. They don't want to make a $2 million decision when someone's raising rates 100 basis points at a time, shocking the system. Mm -hmm. Now that we have at least a little bit of clarity, people at least feel more certain. They feel more certain that, okay, this is probably more or less how high rates are going to go, maybe a little bit higher, maybe, but they have some certainty. And so they're now, they're, 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 they're re-entering and transacting in the market. And so, I mean, I always say like, you know, you want to be negotiating uh, when sentiment is the worst, right? Like you can really go in and lowball a seller after a hundred basis point rate hike and say, Hey, listen, like it's bad out there. It's ugly. And you can get some good deals. And I still think the best deals so far, so far have been negotiated, you know, end of summer, early fall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but a lot of the, but a lot of people hit pause then, hoping prices would fall further, right? And I think, I think, and we talked about this. I think in the last episode that I think that's one thing that's fueling the demands today. It's all those people who hit pause in the fall, expecting prices to tank, and they've been flat since July, and they're like throwing in the towel and basically saying, "All right, I need a home now." Like I'm sick of sitting on the sidelines, right? Um, and yeah. that's why we have this slight bump in sales. I think. And this is coming back down to the uh, the bear trap. Yeah. Yeah. So let's put it up there. So this is a, a chart that makes the rounds. I'm going to describe it a bit for our listeners. Um, you know, you've got uh, basically it's focused on how the public reacts. Um, you know, there's a mania phase, enthusiasm, greed, delusion, new paradigm, denial. And that denial then is okay you know the new paradigm was probably oh we can sustain these prices it'll always stay here uh then that falls and that's what we're seeing right now now i, I said a bear trap it's actually a bull trap what am i saying <laughs> <laughs> sorry guys um but then all of a sudden in the middle people start to like john use the word throw in the towel or maybe this is just how it is so there's like this return to normal feeling now is that setting us up for a trap you want me to take it, John? Oh, or you, you can to... start. You can start. I'll hear what you say, and then I'll jump in. I, I think it's certainly possible, right? I mean, to rule out. I, I, I think right now there's there's still a lot of uncertainty. There's there is. I think it's going to be a very volatile year. Um, and so, yeah, the long, you know, the short answer is I don't, I don't, I'm, I don't know, and I think that should be the answer for from most people. Um, but I think part of this, a little bit, John, it kind of concerns me around like. What so in Vancouver, I think we're a little bit ahead of you, but in 2016, we kind of had that blow off top, and then the market started to kind of slowly roll over. And then the government brought in the foreign buyer tax, and then the market just completely tanked. It froze, went froze for about six months, and then it actually came back to life in the spring of 2017. And people said, Oh, see, and uh, and so we had a pretty good spring of 17, and then the market after that rolled back over and 18, 2018 was quite a soft year. And so um, I think that's certainly a possibility this time around, right? I mean, I think certainly when you look at in between the weeds, like the, all the mortgage deferrals that we talked about, or not mortgage deferrals, but these you know, amortizations that are growing, uh, I think, you know, the reality is, is you've got very indebted households and, and rates are up 400 basis points. I think that's going to start to bite on, on, consumer spending and, and the economy. And so I still think there's those risks out there that this could could very well see, you know, a soft uh, housing market next year. Hard to say. So and the issue is if I maybe it's more like a frustrated bull trap because I'm I'm not getting the sense that the buyers are exuberant, but they're almost like, oh well, this is how it is. And you know, if we get back in now, is the concern that some of these buyers could be underestimating the risks? When we talk about a bull trap, I, I mean, when I talk to them, I think I think most people buying today. I mean, just my perspective, most I think 
understand the risks and appreciate that prices might dip further, right? I, yeah. I don't think most are expecting like a 40% crash, but I do think most think that it's possible the next year, year and a half, that prices are down a little bit. And I think people just don't care because they're buying for five to 10 years and they need a place to live, right? Uh, so it's a new being. It's the new bearable. Yeah. I mean, and, and Steve, <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, it's these 100% right. I mean, we don't know the correct answers. We don't know the path. I mean, we'd be silly to say that there are, are not still risks and uncertainty. I mean, rates could go higher than we think. I mean, I know everyone's talking about like just another quarter point in June, but I mean, they could go higher if, if the dollar starts tanking. And quite frankly, like a booming housing market almost like gives the freaking Bank of Canada more ammo to just yeah. say, yeah, okay, we'll hike a little bit more. Like, mm -hmm. heck, you know, people are still buying houses like That's crazy. I think that's the most important like message that, you know, people should take away. Cause I, I hear it in the industry, right? Like naturally it's an industry that like likes to hype things up and, and um, you know, one of the hype things I'm seeing a lot and you see it on TikTok and Instagram and all this stuff. Oh, you know, markets back multiple offers. It's like, well, careful what you wish for, because yeah. if it truly is a sustain, if it is a sustained rally, like, why would the Bank of Canada even contemplate cutting rates? So it just means higher for longer, which I think creates more issues. Higher yeah. for longer, I think, creates more issues. So yeah, I, I, like I said, it's, it's, it's just a strange market right now. Yeah. So let's do a quick interest rate corner on that on that uh, note. You've touched on it. Uh, Bank of Canada meets tomorrow. What are your predictions, not only for tomorrow? I think a lot of experts are suggesting there may just be a pause. The pause continues, uh, no movement uh, on the bank's policy rate. And what do you think might happen uh, over the year? I think you've already touched on, you know, if we see more of uh, this growth of this boom in prices in, in, in housing and other sectors, you expect that the bank would actually have to come in and start cutting rates. So why don't you both explain why you're thinking about that and why the disparity between the Canadian and U.S. dollars is playing into that as well? Just, okay. <laughs> I mean, I'll sure. I mean, so, you know, a lot of, I think there's, I think the, the consensus is potentially another hike in June. Um, you know, but again, one of the concerns of course, is that, you know, the federal reserve in the U S uh, you know, has way more hikes ahead than Canada does. And, you know, one of the arguments is, well, what impact is it going to have on the dollar and will the bank of Canada have to, they're not going to match like point for point or hike for hike, but will they have to be a little bit more aggressive to protect the dollar? And, you know, I think we have to be open to that that's a hundred percent a possibility. I mean, whether that's an extra 25 or 50 basis points. And like I said, a booming housing market gives them more ammo to do that. You know, the, uh, an economy, if it's, if things are relatively stable, gives them more ammo to do that strong jobs like that we've been seeing recently, like strong job growth gives them more ammo to do that. So it's very possible like that we might see that, um, you know, in the second half or later half of this year. And, and like Steve said, I mean, this just kind of doubles down on this higher for longer, um, and, and again, I've always been more concerned, quite frankly, about like next year more than this year, because like the longer rates stay high is like, you know, then things just start breaking. Like you can only do this negative amortization for so long, you know what I mean? And, and, you know, eventually people are going to have to renew their mortgages, you know, and then they're going to feel the payment. You can't renew with an, a negative amortization. They got to renew at a, a proper, you know, mortgage payment. And even if it's at a 35 year AM, they're going to feel that increase. Yeah. I think uh, my view is, 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 you know, a continued pause, um, you know, tomorrow or whenever, you know, this is being released here. Um, continued pause. I mean, you had fourth quarter GDP come in at zero flat, you know, the BOC's uh, estimate was for 1.3% growth. So that was a huge miss, um, something they'll obviously be watching. But yeah, the reality is, is, you know, to your point, I mean, I don't see how you can keep pace with the Fed. I mean, the reality is, you'll probably have a weaker Canadian dollar as a result. But um, I think Canada has about 30% variable rate mortgages, I think in the US, it's about 9%. But not only that, like, Let's be honest, pretty much all Canadian mortgages are essentially not fixed mortgages. I mean, most as long as you can fix them for five years. So like the interest rate sensitivity is so much higher 
in Canada. I mean, you can go to the US, people were taking out 30 year fixed mortgages at like 3%. Yeah. You know, well, that's the norm months. in the US yeah. is to have 30 year mortgages. Yeah. yeah. 30 years, right? So yeah. it's like, it's like, there's no, like, there's very little, like, the, the monetary policy channel to flow through to households in the US is, it's, it's, it's much different than in Canada. So, um, yeah, I think people that think we're going to go, you know, an eye for an eye with the Fed, I, I don't, I don't see that. So let's actually turn, uh, talk a little bit more about that. Um, I, I'm calling this another from the pile of money stuff that's not working like it used to. <laughs> um, uh, John, you tweeted about Paul Krugman making an observation. This was actually interesting from the American uh, perspective. So uh, I'm going to put it up here. The most puzzling chart in economics right now, much speculation about why U.S. Fed hikes haven't done much to slow the economy, but too much focus is on business and consumers. Housing is where monetary policy usually has the most traction. So um, his point being, if you were looking at, so and he, he has a chart here showing that while the monetary uh, chain, uh, policy change has dropped housing starts to almost you know, a very sharp drop off. I'm not sure it's landing there. Um, probably around the, I'm seeing maybe dipping below or at the 1000 uh, units level, huge drop off, you can see. For some reason, he's noting that the employment level in residential building construction is remaining extremely high and is growing. That's the blue line there for viewers. Um, so this is very strange. If you were looking at Paul Krugman says, if you're looking at housing starts, you'd think there was a significant slowdown in process, but employment hasn't declined at all. I honestly don't know quite what's happening, but surely this is a large part of the mystery. So, John, are you into UFOs and other mysteries? <laughs> like, what is this? I'm, I mean, I, I can't speak for the U.S. market, but because um, I don't look at this, but if we look at Toronto and Canada, uh, I mean, I think we'd see very similar trends, like we're going to see construction start to slow down, but we're not going to see a massive decline in, in labor, quite frankly, because it takes time to do that. Be I mean, a lot of it has to do with the fact that at least in the GTA, a lot of our construction is, is high rise condos, right? So it, the key thing is to look at not just what the starts are, but how many units we have under construction at any given point in time. And that is going to take longer to dip down, right? So, you know, as long as we're building, and I think we have like a record number of houses under construction right now, as long as we stay close to that level, um, we're not going to see a massive uh, drop in, uh, in in construction labor. I don't think so. Like, I think we'd have to see this go on for years before we see that. To make sure I understand, John, you're saying because that record number of completions we've seen, like condo completions no, are... So record we have a record i believe we are we're at a record number of con, like not condos houses under construction so low rise and condos and okay. it's and it's a record number because we're building more and more condos and those take longer to build so they sit in our data of under construction for a lot longer right um you know but then so that me yeah so but then that means because that mix of properties has changed the mm -hmm. the idea that you can try and cool down uh, yeah. you know, wages or whatever, that that part of the piece you're trying to do, there's mm -hmm. a bit of a lag maybe because of the type of properties that are under construction. Ex yeah, exactly. So, I, and I think it'll take some time before we see that kind of flow through into the economy. And that's kind of going back to why we think higher for longer is bad. Like we'll, we'll muscle through a, a decline in construction starts this year, you know, but if in, if housing starts plummet again in 2024, like the longer this goes on, the more the, the more likely you start feeling the impact on the economy. So um, whereas the U.S. can be very different because I think they have far more low rise construction. So it could be more puzzling in the case of, of uh, Krugman's original tweet. That's, know, yeah, that's funny that you funny that you brought that up because I was literally reading a thread this morning from uh Francis Donald retweeted it, but it was from Eric Basmagian. I don't know. He's a good follow on Twitter. He's got something like 100,000 followers, but he puts out a lot of good economic research where he actually basically just explains sort of Krugman's question, which is essentially that building permits um, typically peak out and then construction employment follows suit. And it's always construction employment on the residential side. Mm -hmm. 
which is extremely volatile and sensitive to, to the change in permits. Um, and so that will actually be, you'll probably see the steepest drop off in terms of job losses actually in the residential construction sector. So he's basically, he basically argues that just because it hasn't happened yet, doesn't mean it won't. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at in the U S permits are in fact rolling over. And so it's, it's probably just a matter of, you know, months, uh, at least in his opinion, until you start seeing employment in the residential construction side. And I think that's the same in Canada, right? I mean, we all know like housing starts are rolling over more so to, to, to John's point, right? Like where you're seeing that big drop off is in single family houses. We don't build a ton of single family houses mm -hmm. um, because, you know, we build mostly condos and once the permit's approved and your concrete's poured, you're going to finish off that job. Um, so it's, you'll see the sort of slowdown, I think years ahead. Yeah, that's, uh, that's helpful. All right. Um, how are we going to finish off today? I thought I would, uh, <laughs> maybe poke you guys back a little bit. So right. this has been a lot, I'm a patriotic Canadian. There's been a lot of blaming Canadian officials and, you know, everything, um, and rightly so with how our housing and our economy is being managed. But looking at a recent article in The Guardian, I uh, noticed uh, that global surveys are showing that housing prices are coming down after years of low interest rate fueled booms, not only in Canada, but this article points out uh, there's Canada, there's the usual suspects, Australia and New Zealand, of course. But interestingly, also Sweden and Germany, other markets that have you know, had the reputation of being more stable, uh, have also seen, you know, huge drops after low interest rate field booms. Uh, and then similarly, Steve, your colleagues on the Looney Hour podcast are pointing out that inflation, when it comes to the inflation battle, everybody's kind of like all hands on decks trying to get um, that fire out. And now we hear that Spain and France is seeing record breaking upticks in inflation. So is Canada, you know, just being pulled along by these factors? Or is there something that makes you point to the fact that, you know, Canadian policymakers could have done, should have done, or, or seen something to do things differently here? Or are they just kind of, you know, being pulled along by the whims of these international trends? Uh, I mean, I think, well, I mean, Canada certainly not, you know, Bank of Canada is certainly not a monetary policy setter. I think they basically import their monetary policy predominantly from the Fed um, and, and larger central banks. So we're kind of like order takers. Um, but the, yeah, I mean, the reality is, is, you know, domestically, you know, what can policymakers do? Well, yes, we should have higher rates. I mean, that's been the biggest driver of, of, of housing prices over the last decade is interest rates. But I think, you know, what you can, what you can do, I guess more domestically is is well. I mean, you can control immigration pretty easily with a lever. Um, so you know, dialing that up and dialing it down when necessary is a pretty obvious one. Um, I think that zoning um, is is another big one that's pretty easy to change with with a lever, but nobody seems to want to have the political appetite to do that. So it's really hard to get things built. There's a lot of red tape, a lot of bureaucracy. So. I don't know. There's just so many things. It's it's such a complicated piece um, here. But I think there's a lot of levers that people could have pulled. I mean, we clearly overstimulated. We clearly sent out way too many checks in the mail during the pandemic. Um, I remember testifying in the House of Commons there, whatever it was, um, you know, just before they passed their last round of stimulus saying, hey, you guys should keep an eye on the housing market because this is flowing over into that and obviously nobody cared anyways but um so yeah it's it's just so many policy errors are on so on so many different on different levels really oh man do you have a c-span uh, clip of that i'll, I'll throw <laughs> it up here <laughs> yeah I, I i had it on uh yeah i think it's still on youtube so uh, i'll see if i can send it to you <laughs> throw it over it. to me we're gonna put that in there we care that's a highlight now we have uh we have mr steven sartsky I think some of the ramifications of of the spending that's coming through, there's always there's always knock on effects, and I just think that we have to be cognizant of those knock on effects, which I think that certainly we're we're seeing that showing up in the housing sector. John, uh, yeah, I mean, I I agree with Steve on the monetary policy front. I mean, the the Bank of Canada is just kind of following the Fed for the most part. I think when we look at the bank, I think my criticism for the longest time, and I think most people are starting to come around to this as well and i've seen i think the the chief economist at td wrote a note about this that 
the biggest mistake probably was, you know, what they call his forward guidance, which is basically like, you know, you know, the, the banking has different levers, which is, you know, the policy rate, they have quantitative easing, which they did, but forward guidance was just like, their their statements about the future you know remember that classic tiff macklin where he said rates will stay low for a very long time go out and take on debt and buy a home and take on a mortgage well that that was a mistake right um you know to be that aggressive because it i mean it partly contributed to this this frenzy that we saw um but with respect to house prices i mean listen every everyone in the world complains about house prices i mean Canadians have been complaining about house prices since I bought my first home like 20 years ago. So the the complaints about high home prices is always a relative argument, right? Based on where home prices were a year or two before this current year. But the fact is, when you look at Canada, we're a hundred percent like off the charts when you compare us against most other countries around the world. Like forget, like if you look at, I mean, there's this classic chart of like comparing Canada's house prices and incomes to the US. And it's like, you know, Canada's just exploded relative to the US. Um, and yeah, these are not all perfect metrics, of course. Do you know what I mean? But definitely Canada's uh, significantly more expensive than most other G7 countries, uh, and I think we are actually the highest, like if you look at price to income, price to rent across the G7. So Canada has its own challenges. And like Steve said, they have tools to do it. I mean, the funny thing is, I mean, when I posted that tweet about, you know, kind of Krugman's kind of confusion is like, the funny thing is like monetary policy is trying to cool the supply of housing just as the feds are ramping up the demand from increasing immigration targets. So it's like, what do you think is going to happen? Like, it's like, it's a very predictable the the pressures that this is going to put on the market um and it is what it is i mean i think the it's going to just the housing charts are kind of interesting though right like so i always have to put it into like context because i i you know i chat with a lot of american friends and investors and stuff over there and you know they always flag the canadian housing market which they have every right to it's it's from an outsider's perspective it's bonkers even from you know locally here it's pretty crazy but like you have to remember that it's like everybody basically funnels into like the GTA, you know, all the immigration and like how much of the GTA makes up like the national house price index. It's like, it takes up the bulk of the index. And so I don't always look at it and say, well, I mean, housing is pretty affordable in Alberta, Saskatchewan and Manitoba. But uh, you know, the reality is that most people don't want to move and live there. So, and it is just a lot, I mean, outside of Alberta, obviously there's, there's not a lot of economic prosperity. And, you know, it's funny because I was chatting with immigration uh, consultant, uh, last week and you you know he's like yeah like the reality is he's like i help bring these people into the country and you know get them work and all that and he's like the reality is is like they start here and they end up in the gta and they end up in vancouver and that's where everybody goes and there's just so you inflate you inflate the value home, home values in these two large cities that's a great point steve even that global survey from the guardian showed that in the u.s while they didn't have the overall drops that we were seeing in Australia, Sweden, and Germany, San Francisco had the Bay area. So yeah. it's like taking some of their rocket ships that go up and down on their roller coasters and concentrating it in Canada into the two biggest cities here. Mm -hmm. um, and that actually uh, is a nice uh, end point, I think, to leave off on. In response to uh, your call for questions, John, someone said, how come people can't figure out that the hovels we're buying here for a million dollars in Toronto and Vancouver are overpriced, they're not great, look at Detroit, look at whatever. Well, I don't mean to be rude, but is the choice, do I want to live in Detroit or Toronto? Like, <laughs> I think, I, I mean, I don't think most Canadians have the ability to just pick up and move wherever they think price of values are correct <laughs> for that's, homes. That's the one nice thing, honestly, about the US is the optionality, right? It's like, yeah. think how many like large, amazing cities you've got there. If Tons. you get priced out of New York, yeah. you go to like, you go to Arizona or Nashville or well, Boston. not even and think it, yeah, and think of the yeah. tri-state itself and yeah. how like the tri-state area allows all these commuter satellite, you know, yeah. uh, towns. So, you know, it, it, yeah, I, I do think we sometimes. I mean, we have that effect here with the GTA and the Hamilton and and things like that. But just think of that, like you were saying, Steve, around Atlanta that happens around Houston. Like it's just it's on See, another level. 
you get priced out of the GTA and you move to, you know, Moncton, New Brunswick, a population yeah. of a hundred thousand people. Yeah, like, exactly. Exactly. You're you not know, hundred thousand like, people is like a small, like tiny little town in, in rural yeah, United yeah. States. Yeah. Yeah. You're not going up to like upstate New York, for example, and all those cities there, you know, perhaps all of them are a decent size. So yeah, I think there's sometimes I know John and I have kind of rolled our eyes sometimes about the comparisons, but there you go. Uh, I can understand people I, like when you do the scan and you're like, oh, my God, Ryan Gosling just bought a house in LA. <laughs> it's like the same as my neighbor down the street. Shocking. <laughs> you get that I'm nice house lie. in uh, Saskatoon. <laughs> there you go. Half a million bucks. Yeah. So there is a bit of a product comparison fail. I can understand that frustration. All right, guys. Well, any other thoughts as we close out? I thought it was uh, very interesting uh, talking points. We'll see where we go next, I guess, next yeah. month. I think we're in the, you know, we're entering the spring market now here in March. Mm -hmm. So um, March, April will be very interesting months to analyze. Um, typically your busiest, most active months in, in the housing uh, sector. So it'll be interesting to sort of see how the, the data comes through. Yeah, for sure. And I think we'll have some maybe some other guests along too to see like, are these distressed sellers showing up in the data? Mm -hmm. You know, because it is really odd. We're in a real like anecdotal kind of kind of kind of situation. So mm -hmm. let's see what comes next. Thanks, guys. Good. It's always fun uh, making sense of things with you. And uh, yes, to our viewers keep and listeners, keep your great questions coming. And uh, we'll talk to you next month.